Okay, so this is a, uh, I'm going to cover the, the big section uh, in a very short time period. So it's a property of the bulk of uh, bulk polymers, and I have drawn uh, different ways of doing it. Basically, it's trying to understand the stress-strain curve of the polymers, and also that is related to the something called the yield and crazing, and shear band formation or crazing and also cold drawing, depending on whether it's a glassy polymer or a semi-crystalline polymers. Uh, also, uh, for the viscoelasticity, which is a more like a, uh, related to the relationship between in a melt, uh, there is a, uh, enough elasticity uh, combined with a viscosity. And then there is a something that is related to the, what is the subject called the rheology. Uh, this is a very long subject. Uh, I just wanted to focus on give you uh, some molecular perspective and uh, get you to the used to the Beijing languages on this. So let me, uh, this first section is I'm going to talk to you about the stress strain curve. And then this is an introduction part. And this is a figure from the textbook. Uh, the, this is a strain and this is a stress. Okay, so stress goes uh, goes increasing this way, and strain goes increasing in this the other way. And uh, the one good reference point is uh, this is a this is a what typically what glassy polymer looks like. And uh, when you have a semi-crystalline polymers, uh, they usually have this a little mini peaks, and then there is a kind of flat region, and finally they they kind of stiffen up at the end. And this behavior is uh, what is called a cold drawing of the semi-crystal polymer that I'm going to talk to you. Uh, elastomer is uh, essentially has a very large strain elongation until they break, whereas uh, the slope is uh, much shorter than that. And then people also uh, study the elongation of almost like a single crystal, very uh, highly crystalline uh, polymer crystals or uh, fibers when they do that, and uh, it's a much uh, steep rise in the stress uh, with a small strain. So uh, this uh, slope here is what we call the modulus. And if it, this is a tensile, uh, we call the Young's modulus. Okay, and the, usually the symbol is using as an E here. Okay. So uh, let's go back to your high school 101 days when probably you first learned about the Hokkien string. So, so, so you you learn about this is a Hokkien spring, and then the, uh, these are the two different slope, and the, each slope is represented by k, and uh, this is a force. Force is a unit of Newton. This is an X, I guess a unit of length, which is a meter. And the force constant is K, F equal KX. That's a Hookian spring, right? Which is a representative of a spring, which is a well known as a spring when you when you trying to stretch this one by X and the spring constant K. Uh, it can be represented by this. So it is a, a spring constant K as a unit of Newton per meter, and that is a characteristic for the spring. Okay, what about the materials uh, using the same kind of a concept? So I'm going to do the same kind of plot, x, per, x versus y plot, but this time I am going to make it as a stress. Okay, so you can, you can kind of uh, looking at what is shown up there. Stress, and they're using the symbol sigma, and the stress is as a unit of Newton per square meter, okay, which is also known as a Pascal. Okay, so that's a unit of the stress. And also, uh, the what is called the strain is the inner place of the displacement, and that is uh, usually use a epsilon is uh, using the symbol, and it has a unitless. So sometimes they just using for the L as, as their unit. And uh, it is uh, for the elastic material, as you can see that the two different 
uh, material that has a different elasticity. This one, the slope here is what we call the Young's modulus. Okay, so the E is a slope, and that is a Young's modulus. And then it has a unit of uh, Pascal. Okay, so that is a unit for the modulus. And why we have to use uh, stress instead of the force shown up here is because of the stress is defined as a force divided by area. Okay? If you increase uh, the cross-sectional area, it takes uh, uh, more forces, the proportional. So the force is more... Uh, the force is a net result of the intrinsic property of the material, uh, what is called the stress, uh, multiplied by the area. That's a force. So in other words, the stress is a, is a force is what you're pulling it out, but if you double the area of your, let's say, polymer block to stretch, you need to double the forces. So it is more or less uh, the normalized force that uh, you want to stretch them out. And also strain is essentially displacement over the original length. And so this has a no unit, and this one has, once again, the unit of the Pascal. Okay, has no unit. And now it's going to be an important one for the elastic, as you can see, shown, even shown up here as a spring. For the material, you can start to see that People say, okay, this is a uh, elastic material has, that has a uh, the the Young's modulus of E value, and then then the, you you get to see that okay, stress is Young's modulus multiplied by epsilon. So this will be uh, something that will be uh, unique. Uh, one of the constitutive equation for defining the elastic material. Okay, so this section that I am going to continue to, to show, I just gave a brief introduction about the glassy polymer versus semi-crystalline polymer and elastomer. Uh, what about the, the question is, what, what's the values of typical Young's modulus for different polymers? And so what are the typical values? The one good reference point for you to remember is the glassy polymer. The Young's modulus is over about 10 to the 9 um, Pascal. And so what we call the uh, 1 gigapascal. So 1 gigapascal is a glassy polymer's uh, Young's modulus. What about the elastomer? The elastomer, on the other hand, is a soft. The elastomer's Young's modulus. So let me... Let me pull up the different colors. So the elastomer is more like uh, 10 to the 6 Pascal, which is a megapascal, right? So that's the one that the range is, is essentially 1 to 10 megapascal. So that's a, more like a rubber. That's a, more like a glassy polymer, such as a polystyrene, for example. So that, that's an example of this. And the, the uh, semi-crystalline polymer is somewhere in between ranges from 0.1 to 1 gigapascal. And then uh, there's, there's a fundamental interest in the people who wants to understand even further about the nature. So they want to know particularly the polymer fiber, particularly about this along the chain axis. That's about um, 10 to the 11 Pascal, which is about in the ranges about 100 gigapascal. So what's the meaning of parallel to the axis? That the meaning for that, it is essentially when you have uh, chains like this, if you pull this chain along this way, and uh, so essentially CH to CH to this direction, that's about 100 gigapascal. Okay? And whereas, if you look at that, perpendicular to the axis is similar to the glassy polymer. So what that means is 
if these chains are kind of packed like this, and if you want to pull it this way, the average value you anticipate is about 100 uh, gigapascal, no, 1 gigapascal. So it is a very, the crystal domain, if you think about that, is a very, uh, uh, very soft uh, along the chain of perpendicular to the chain orientation, whereas uh, along the chain orientation, it can, it can have a very uh, strong uh, modulus in that. So here's a figure from the textbook, and then they have a polybutylene oxide. So it is a CH2, 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 CH2 oxygen. And if they, they pull the chain along this, this is actually typically, the, they are not really pulling it. It's all, uh, they actually have a spectroscopic way to understand uh, the stress level development at different strain. But when you chain, pull the chain uh, along this direction, you can see that you can have a 460 gigapascal along, along this chain. So it's uh, substantially very stiff if you were able to uh, stretch it. So that, that's what that means is what I hear the quote unquote, what is an ultimate modulus, right? Uh, when, and when you're trying to stretch until the chain is trying to break down and this kind of scenario. So you can see that uh, there are different polymers uh, in this table. People has done that. This is more like a going into the depth of uh, mechanical properties. Polyethylene, and uh, what people has measured is about along the chain axis. So uh, that's about uh, 300 gigapascal, right? So 300 gigapascal for the if you have a polymer like this. It's all CH2 if it's pulling the chain. And then they are using a uh, different method. Uh, the one that I'm, I kind of know is a Raman. Is a, Raman scattering is very sensitive to the stress environment, and they were able to relate that with the Raman scattering. They also, I think, the, they can do the experiment on the next ray or the neutron method. There are, these are the experiment method. They were able to do that. Uh, but when you start, so, and this is an interesting perspective, when you put the polyoxymethylene, this value is all about now the 50, right? So what that means in a molecular sense, if you have a CH2 oxygen, CH2 oxygen, CH2 oxygen, this is a polyacetal. If you have this one stretch that out, this is a now the, the modulus, uh, Young's modulus along this, is about 50 gigapascal. So it get, gets smaller uh, as you go, uh, even going that way. And sometimes uh, you you will see the different values. So it is a, just a good guidance. I think the, if you have a kind of the keep that in mind, yeah. on the order of 100 gigapascal is a sort of the ultimate modulus, Young's modulus that polymer material can, can give out. Whereas a glassy polymer, like I said, this is a very good starting point. Something like a polystyrene is a one gigapascal. That's a modulus. Uh, this one um, can provide it as a, as a polymer molecule. So then the natural question that we can have is, okay, for the real polymers, if I change my elastic the, the crystallinity, and there there are two examples. The, the this is a example A, and this is example B. And example A is a natural rubber. And the retro rubber is actually due to the uh, cis uh, geometric isomer regularity. They can actually form the crystalline domains. By increasing the crystallinity, and there is a chance for you to pull the chain along the, the chain axis, uh, and then your modulus start to go up. But you know the the overall unless the overall the chains are randomly oriented, so it, crystallinity will have some impact uh, in that regard. If you look at the polyethylene upon different crystallinity, this is a modulus, and the Young's modulus is ranging from the one gigapascal to let's say, you know, at most the five. Uh, Five gigapascal, and uh, remember, uh, if if you if you are able to pull the chain along this, you know, uh, the really well uh, along this uh, chain axis direction, and theoretical value, 
ideal, right? theoretical or ideal uh, value is in the range of 300 gigapascal. So this is uh, uh, because of the many random orientation. But the higher the uh, crystallinity, the, um, the higher the Young's modulus you, you will have. And that just uh, uh, you you have a much more uh, chain chains are getting more uh, compact, and then uh, you is the modulus is depend on the overall crystallinity of the sample. 